And it's funny how, uh, how fast things tend to change when we don't expect it. Amen? And uh, I, I truly mean it when I say that it, it really is a, a pleasure that, um, that I get to worship with you and that uh, the rest of the team, every single week, we get to worship with you guys and we get to be a part in leading you uh, in worship. And, I, and I, don't, I don't take that for granted even uh, one second. And I know that to step onto this platform and to be a part of the team of individuals who lead you every single week um, is a task that carries a wondrous weight. Uh, and it is a weight that I know um, Deb and, and Liz, Rebecca, and Stephanie, and um, at times Ethan every now and again when he's back home from college. Uh, and then even, you know, uh, Jackie and, and, uh, and Levi and Martin and Mason and all the people that, that sacrifice all the time that it takes to, to, to worship every week. Um, I know uh, if they were to be asked, they would happily carry that weight um, again and again. Uh, no, no questions asked. Um, Last night, uh, Brother Phil from Berean uh, made the tough call that he would uh, not be able to uh, fellowship with us this morning uh, because of a significant fever uh, that he was having. So uh, if you would, uh, please remember him and his family uh, in his prayers. It is, it is sick season, right? Ooh, it is sick season. Every, everyone's getting sick. So try to, try to remain healthy the, the best that you can. Um, so after he called uh, last night to let me know, I uh, was in bed, I, I rose from my bed, and I gave Jackie a kiss, and I said, I'll be right back, I'm going to go write a sermon. <laughs> I did not come back, and so uh, it is an absolute blessing that I get to stand here and, and share with you almost, almost in real time uh, what the Lord has been uh, teaching me in regards to uh, overcoming labels. The first week uh, in our Ghost of Christmas Past series, uh, we heard from Pastor Derek about uh, overcoming offenses, where uh, he shared with us how when we are uh, tied up in our offenses, we are unable to live the life that God intended us to live. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Josh shared with us how uh, the only way to overcome shame in our life is the very thing that God has rescued us from. It is, it is not to, to rest on what you are not, but rather who Christ is. And lastly, uh, this week before we celebrate the culmination of, of Christmas this Saturday uh, at Christmas Eve service, and then on, a, on Sunday we'll be, we'll be getting together for a, for a family service, uh, I wanted to discuss with you today overcoming labels, and, and really bringing all of this together on what we've been talking about for the uh, past couple weeks. Now, thinking about this, has, uh, has anybody, by show of hands, has anybody ever asked you in like a random fashion, like what your, what your favorite movie is, or like what your, favorite, what your favorite food is? Has anyone had that? Has anyone had that experience all the time? I, uh, I, I really hate, I hate those questions. I don't, I don't like those questions at all. And the reason I don't like those questions is because not only do they change all the time, uh, but you can never think of a clear answer. I remember uh, one time uh, Lincoln was asking me, he goes, Daddy, what's your, you know, what's your favorite color? And I said, well, you know, my, I, I'm pretty sure my favorite color is red. I, mean, I haven't thought about it in a long time. He goes, he goes, no, 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 Daddy, your favorite color is yellow. I said, all right, well, I, guess my, uh, I guess my favorite color is yellow now. And so every, every few months or you know, a couple times a year, he, he changes my favorite color. So I, I really don't know what my favorite color is right now. But I always realize that as soon as you hear this question or as soon as someone asks you of this question, I don't know if anyone can relate with this, your mind goes absolutely blank, right? What's your favorite, what's your favorite musical artist? It's like you've never heard 
a song in your life, right? Or what's your favorite food? And I just always go with, with pizza. Um, so this was kind of the case with the sermon, right? Uh, after I found out, um, I found myself sitting in my office and going over the title again and again, overcoming labels. Okay, overcoming labels. What does it mean to overcome a label? Have I ever overcome a label? Have I fell into labeling other people unjustly? Have, uh, what labels do, do I even wear myself, right? These are, these are some questions that I asked last night as I sat into my chair. And, and uh, honestly, one thought that consistently came to my head is um, this past week, we uh, said goodbye to a, a good brother, right? We said goodbye to uh, Ralph. And um, it was our church family who got together, and I, and I thought about at the, at the service, I thought about all the people who stood and who shared of the, uh, just the beautiful moments to tell, to symbolize of the type of person that he was. And that thought led me down a, a, a greater path of reflections of other services that I've had the pleasure to be involved in um, in the past. And, and in, in all the years of doing this, I think about I think about these, these moments that stand out to other people and that not only these moments are vital in, in death as we remember our loved ones, but these moments are also vital in life. What do we do with these? What do we do with these, these, these memories? What do we do with these, these characteristics that we so love about our loved ones, our friends, and our family. So I want to take a moment, and the uh, I want to take a moment and read uh, in Scripture where Jesus defied labels and and really what this means for us. So not only did he defy labels that were being placed on him or ascribed to him, but he defied, he refused even to place labels on other people. And so uh, we're going to be hanging out in Luke chapter 7. So like I said, they're going to be up there on the, uh, on the screen, but I would, be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask or I didn't say, uh, if you do not have a Bible, uh, my encouragement to you is to follow along uh, there in uh, Luke chapter 7. If you don't own a Bible, uh, please snag one of those in the back. And if you, don't, if, if you don't have one at home, please take that home with you. That is our gift to you. All right. So uh, we're going to be reading in Luke Chapter 7, verses 36, and we're going to be going all the way to 50. So let's, let's, um, let's, let's read this and see, see what's happening here. Uh, one of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at a table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him, when he saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him, or Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the largest debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, as is customary. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. 
You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So the question here, church, is where do you see yourself in this passage? There are obviously more than uh, just three people in this room. But when we look at the three different people in this room, we have to ask ourselves, who do we most relate with? Do we relate with, do we, uh, do we relate with Simon, the Pharisee, who, who labels others, specifically this woman? Too many times we see ourselves even like the woman who, whom is labeled by others. And unfortunately, too few times we see ourselves like Jesus, seeing self and others correctly. So while, yes, the sermon title um, today is called uh, Overcoming Labels, what I want you to take away from this is that we are not labels. We are not labels. So what is the most uncomfortable dinner you have ever been to? Think about this for a second. What is the most uncomfortable dinner you have ever been to? What do you, what do you remember feeling from that dinner? Here in uh, Luke 7, uh, we're invited into this story, and, and yet again, around another table, around another meal, uh, we are with Jesus. But unlike some of our other meals, this one is a little bit different, right? The air is, uh, the air is very thick, right? And, but not with the, the sweet scent of, uh, of food, as we might ex- expect. Uh, in this room, you can, you can cut the tension with a knife. Jesus has accepted uh, the dinner invitation of a Pharisee, so we can be uh, uh, pretty sure that this fellow, he, he wasn't exactly Jesus' best friend. Uh, nope, uh, he was not even one of his closest disciples. He was possibly even a, an adversary uh, to Jesus' ministry. And, and if, I can, if I can just pause here for a second. We're obviously going to be talking about uh, uh, Jesus's relationship and, and how Jesus addresses this woman, right? And we're going to be taking away from that really ultimately how, how we address others as it relates to uh, uh, labels. But, but if I'm reading this passage, right, and I'm, and I'm kind of looking a little bit outside of it, how much is it like Jesus to accept a dinner invitation to one of his adversaries, right? So, so there, I'm, I'm not naive. There may be uh, uh, someone whom you're thinking in your head right now who you may not get along with very well, right? When was the last time you invited them out to dinner? When was the last time you sought to eat with them? Even though you knew this is going to be awful, <laughs> There's going to be so much tension. This is going to be the most uncomfortable, awkward time of my week. Jesus did that. He accepted this invitation. He pursued this Pharisee. He went and gave this Pharisee time. The sort of, this is the, uh, this is the uh, sort of meal where silences are awkward and long, where everyone is second-guessing everything that is said. Uh, they're reading into body language. They're picking apart motives. 
aside from Jesus, there is no trust at all in this room and certainly no love. Have you ever been to a meal like that? Let me ask you this. Have you ever been to a meeting like that? And below it all, there is this reoccurring shame. You know, maybe we don't have to uh, imagine uh, what it's like to, to lose your name, your identity, to be, to be known only by a label. Maybe uh, we know uh, a sinner today could be many things. It could be uh, just as easier to, to, see, a, uh, to see a miser or, or a bigot, an adulterer, a gossip, a drunk, a whore, a perjurer, a cow, a bu- the abused, the raped, a convict, a crazy person, an addict. So we see, we see the word sinner used. But take that word sinner out. It would be just as easy to plug in any of these words. There is a label for each of us. We all hide at least one label deep down into our hearts. And we hope with all of our might that we're the only ones that know about it. Most of us have had that moment when we, when we ceased to be a person, when we found ourselves overcome by shame and guilt and self-loathing and loss. And all that remained was that horrible label. This woman at the table with, with Jesus, she becomes invisible. No one seems to have noticed the the thing, the sinner, who has uh, snuck into this tense gathering until she touches Jesus, until she crosses that barrier between the respectful and the shameful. And all of her worst fears come true, kneeling at Jesus' feet, utterly vulnerable in her love and her outpouring, suddenly the hostile eyes of these respectful men around the table are all fixed on her. Why is she even there? Why open herself up to the hatred, the disgust, the loathing of people who must have made her life miserable on a daily basis, who didn't even see her as human, who had made her a label. What could be so powerful? What could compel her into that place of shame and hostility, that that place of vulnerability, a place where she is invisible or reviled? One thing and one thing only, and it is the same thing. It is the same thing that motivated the 10 leopards to, to cry out to Jesus to say, heal us. It is the same thing that that motivated the the, the party of individuals who lowered the man into into the room where Jesus was to say, heal us. It is one thing and one thing only, and that is forgiveness. Forgiveness that gave her an identity. No shame could strip away. No no human could could censor or or could erase. Forgiveness that came as an unexpected gift, a precious thing, a sparkling gem of freedom when she expected only kicks and harsh words. It was a gift, not a reward, not a wage. It was unearned. It was unlooked for. It was unexpected, and it was simply overwhelming. What freedom, church. What relief she must have felt. 
No wonder she, she knelt and, and kissed Jesus' feet. No wonder she, she washed them with her tears and her hair and, and anointed him with, with sweet and costly oil. You see, church, we, we live in a, in a culture of exchange. I, I give you money, right? You give me a service or a product. I give you my time, and you compensate me with money. Humans have been that way for a long time. There's always been a going rate for sheep. But God's economy is pure gift, costly gift, but gift that costs us nothing. We have no currency that can buy or earn what God would give. No work we can do that would even equal the value of what we are offered. I was listening to a... um, I was listening to a comedian, and he was talking about how he, uh, he went out to, to lunch with, a, with another uh, famous comedian. And he was saying, uh, um, he's like, I, I, whatever I do, you know, I'm, I'm really honored that this, this incredibly famous comedian is taking me out to lunch. I want to make sure I pay. I want to make sure that I am, that I am respectful of his time, that I am, I'm being generous with, with my money. And um, they, they enjoy a, a, a good lunch, and then... Um, the lunch concluded, and, and the comedian goes, well, where's the, you know, where's the bill? And the other comedian responds with, it was already taken care of before you even got here. And I think about that in terms of God's great gift, that, that when, we, when we walked into the restaurant of life, the bill was already paid for. God has, has circumvented that cost for us. For the, for the moment we try to pay, we realize we've had God's love and forgiveness since before we were born offered to us. It was slipped into our hearts while we were still screaming from the shock of this cold, bright world. It was snuck into our lives by a, by a God who won't let us see the gift coming, who, who sneaks it into the house and slips it around our wrist and says, do you, do you like it? We don't, we don't find these stories surprising where, where someone asks Jesus for forgiveness or healing, where they, where they fall on their faces and they beg. These stories are they're neat and they're easy to understand. They repented, and hence they were, they were forgiven. In our minds, we look at this exchange as, as neat and orderly and, and clear. And then Jesus sits down at the table of his adversary, and tears of joy and thankfulness from a woman he has never met cut straight through the tension. The meeting is, is no longer about uh, their, their divisions. It's no longer about what this Pharisee's opinion is of Jesus. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't think Jesus really gave a rip. At that time, Jesus plugged directly into what was going on in her life and her great need. Luke has made it so that there is no way to misinterpret. The woman who who kneels at Jesus' feet, she did nothing to ask for or earn her forgiveness. We don't don't even know how she received it afterwards. When, When she left this house, she realized that she was a person again. She had an identity. And forever, she was no longer a label. All we know is that she was forgiven, and that gift was so precious, that relief so sweet, it flowed from her in exuberant love. Love that that overcame the shame and the offense that she felt. Love that, that no longer cared who saw or what they thought or said. 
nevertheless, what she saw in herself or what she thought about herself or what she said about herself. The part of this passage that stood out to me as I'm, I'm reading through this is uh, at, at a moment, Jesus looks directly at the woman, but he's still talking to Simon. And he says, he says, do you, do you see this woman? You know, listen to this. Do you see her? Not a sinner. Not shame, not an embarrassment, not someone who, who her mere presence is an offense to me. A woman. A woman who has shown great love in front of you. And everyone here, a woman who has been freed from her shame and her fear by forgiveness, whose heart has been made free to love. There is more shame in our world, as we learned last week, than there is water in the oceans. Shame that that we hide deep in our own hearts. Shame that we, we cast on other people. Shame that follows us like a shadow that we can't shake, right? Shame that keeps us from really seeing one another for what we are, beloved, forgiven children of God. Over the past few years, um, the Holy Spirit has been teaching me to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy, right? Um, And it's been valuable. Uh, uh, Rainey Brown uh, put it in this way. Sympathy is is standing at the top of a hole, looking down at someone who who is trapped and saying, man, that really stinks. Hey, at least you're still alive, right? Empathy is getting a ladder climbing down into the hole, putting your arm around that person and saying, hey, I'm here. I think the ability of having empathy and Jesus seeing her for not her label, not what she was known for, but seeing her for who she really is, I don't think that is unique to Jesus. I don't think we're, we're seeing a, an incredible miracle here that can only be done by the, by the Son of God. I think we're seeing a basic human trait that is given to us when we truly grasp the gospel. Every one of us, the bumbling waiter who, who got our order wrong on Friday, he is beloved. He is forgiven. He is a child of God. The the surly checkout girl, the the homeless man that we saw on the street, the neighbor who refuses to play by neighborhood rules, the co-worker who is so wrong about politics, the woman who we were told to avoid because she's no better than she should be. The man with the the pinched face and the worried eyes who everyone knows is a loser. The person inside you that you desperately try to hide. Forgiven and loved right now. From the moment we were born, that was offered to us. So what do you need to be free to realize that all the chains of of shame and offense are simply, they they are ghosts and they are phantoms. There is nothing hidden in your heart that forgiveness has already been offered long before you even knew you needed it. So can we allow, like this woman, allow our hearts to be unclenched? Can we finally look and see the woman, see her face, See her beauty and honestly, her terror, her scars and her hurt and her healing. See her and not who we think she is. Can we, church, can we look at our wives? Can we look at our husbands? 
Can we look at our children, our friends, our parents, our neighbors, our acquaintances, our adversaries and enemies, and see them? Not for some offense that they may have caused us, but for who they really are. I think when we start there, we begin to empathize in the same way that Jesus has. So what happens if we do? What happens if we, if we let go of these labels and the assumptions and we renounce the shame that accompany them? We have been forgiven. We have been set free to love God at this point, And we have been set free to love one another. Now hear me, church. Not to agree with one another all the time. Not to be the same as each other. Maybe not even to like one another all the time. Amen? But to see each other and to be moved by love for that person. To feel that compassion. Not a, not a forced mandate. Right? We, we almost carry Matthew 22 like it's this obligatory, like, 12th commandment, our 11th commandment, right? Love God and love others. Well, I got, I got to love this person. I got to love this person. It's something I have to do. But rather, we have that same knee-jerk reaction that Jesus had when he looked upon the crowds, Our lives are filled with with private shame and public fear, darkness that is pierced by forgiveness, totally overcome by it. Church, I want to invite you right now to live in that forgiveness, in the assurance that that God has, has covered you with the mantle of forgiveness. He has blotted out the dark of each of our sins with the light, that he has given to us through the gospel, that it has happened. And then if you have made that decision to follow Jesus, that it has defined every relationship you create. But for some of us, our eyes are are shut tight for fear, too tight to really believe that we are, we are already free. We, we've done nothing, nothing to deserve uh, this release, but yet God has, has turned the key to the shackles of our oppression. Nothing to deserve love, but God loved us before our grandparents were even dreams. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's what makes us free to love one another and to actually love ourselves, free to be the diverse place that we are as a church, full of people who might have never chosen one another in that outside world, that world where labels are everything, and that those who are labeled differently cannot even talk to anyone. We have been made free through the mercy and through the love of God, through God's economy of gift. The only question that remains is what will we do with our gift that we have been given? What will we do when we are invited into the kingdom of God? I'd like to to read a poem uh, in relation to the, to the kingdom of God that illustrates this um, very clearly. It's from an artist, uh, Josh Kellum. You may have heard it. Uh, and he reminds us that <clears throat> the kingdom of God is for the burnouts. It's for the broken and the broke, the drug addicts, the divorced, the HIV positive, the herpes ridden, the hopeless, for the outcasts that have been created by the church and for the outcasts of our society that have been created by us. 
The kingdom of God is for the brain damage, the incurably ill, for the barren, for the pregnant too many times and the pregnant at the wrong time. This is for the overemployed, the underemployed, the unemployable, and the unemployed. This is for the swindled, the shoved aside, the left aside, the replaced, the incompetent, and the stupid. This is for the emotionally starved and the emotionally dead. The kingdom of God is for the the bigoted, the murderers, the child molesters, the brutals, the drug lords, the terrorists, the perverted, the raging alcoholics, the overconsumers, the incredibly ugly, the dumb, the ignorant, the starving, the filled, the filthy rich. The kingdom of God is for everyone, and the kingdom of God is for me. So I would ask, who do you see yourself in this passage? Do you see yourself like like Simon the Pharisee who is quick to label someone and dismiss them, writing them off as and not truly seeing them? Have we been guilty of labeling others? Do you see yourself like the woman who has accepted this label of others, who have been defined by the by the thing that has accept, has been accepted to them? who has been crippled by paralyzing fear of what others think. Have you adopted a label by others? Or do you see yourself like Jesus, whom when he looked upon the crowds, he did so with compassion, knowing full well the complete life of every single one of them. Do you see self and others correctly? In conclusion, I am fully convinced that God did not smite Phil with a holy head cold. I do believe that he works all things together for his good. And that I have had to contend with this passage for the last uh, few hours and that personally it has helped me and has reminded me that I, and I hope that it has done the same for you. That when we are tempted to succumb to the idea of how we think other people see us or how we see ourselves, even, we are forgetting the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We are seeking to return to slavery the place where the chains upon ourselves once again and bear the weight of that cruel, cruel master. Once more, we are not praising God for his rescue, but rather yearning to return for Egypt once again. My hope this morning that, uh, my prayer for rather myself and for you, church, is that when that temptation comes, that we are given rescue and greater hope that we are reminded by the, by the Holy Spirit that we are loved and that we are purchased and that this doesn't become this nonchalant approach that as we wake up every day and we say, well, well yes, I'm a, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to live in a certain way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a certain thing. I'm going to make sure I don't do a bunch of other things. But rather, when we wake up in the morning, we are so compelled to plead and say, God, make me more like you. Give me the eyes that you have, that when I look upon the people today, I have compassion for them. So we are going to um, take a moment. While I invite the the music team to uh, come back up, I would... I would like you to um, I would like you to uh, join me as we we close in our last song to reflect on this. Uh, so, if you would, if you would take a moment, um, if you would if you would bow your heads and and close your eyes for a moment, um, I, I want to talk about this specifically. For the past few weeks, we have been going over these these areas in our lives that prevent us, rather, per, that become this great distraction to us. From, from being the person, the man, the woman, the husband, the wife, the child that God has called us to be. We've, we've held on to these areas of offenses. 
And we have, we have adopted onto ourselves this shame that has defined us. And so as we close out this series... I would like to ask you, is that real for you? When Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman? When you look in the mirror, do you see the person whom God has created, that he has adopted, and that he has purchased with his very own blood? What label have we placed upon ourselves? What have we adopted that is preventing us from being like this woman who is able to unclench her heart and embrace this gift of God? As Becca plays and as we, as we meditate on this church, I want to encourage you. After the service, I'm going to be um, sitting up here uh, in the front. And I encourage you, please feel free to, to grab some coffee and to fellowship with the body. But if there's a way that I can, that I can pray with you, if there is a choice that you need to make, a label that you must cast aside, please feel free to come and seek me out. If we are unable to connect today, I, I do want to encourage you to reach out to the church during this week. Please do not let a day go by without having this conversation. The final song we sing this morning is one that we sang last year, and I feel that it, it begs uh, to be repeated every single year as we reflect on why Jesus has come. He has come to, to rescue the weak and the unstable, the barren and the waiting, those who are weary of praying, the, the bitter and broken, the guilty and hiding, those who have nothing and those who are unfaithful. He has answered that as the lamb who was given who is slain for our pardon, whose promise is peace. Christ is born for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have rescued us, that you have redeemed us, that you have...